Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me, two key contributing journalists, Byron and Steve. This week, we're discussing Australia's cooling relationship with the focus of a previous love affair, um, the Mazda 3. Uh, we'll look at three recent entrants to the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with a man on the move from California to Texas in this week's Musk Watch. So stay with us. But first of all, we are going to talk about the Mazda 3 and how um, is it possible that Australians have fallen out of love with the Mazda 3? And a very own Tung Nguyen wrote a news story this week that came out of the back of the latest VFACTS registration uh, data. And uh, it looks to be the case um, that it was once Australia's best-selling car, but it could be that other offerings that Mazda has brought into the market more recently, specifically the CX-30, is eating into its volume. Um, its sales have actually, uh, the Mazda 3 sales, that is, have plummeted 43.6% uh, year on year, uh, year to date, in the latest VFAX figures. Um, Steve, I, for one, when the Mazda 3 in its late, most recent generation arrived, thought it was a terrific looking car. It started to sell very strongly. Um, do you think it's maybe just people aren't loving hatches and conventional cars as much as they were or something else? I think as soon as I, I think of the Minogue comparison, I think that like a prettier sister has come along and everyone wants the new one. But it's uh, <laughs> for me, I love the Mazda 3 and the look of it. But um, as soon as you park a CX-30 next to it, that's the car my wife wants. If you wanted the Mazda 3, right? and as soon as Good the CX-30 call. comes along, that's the thing. The only one issue we had with the Mazda 3, because we seriously considered buying one, was that um, I found that my kids were getting sick in the back because the, the sides being quite high, the windows being quite high, and it could be my driving or it could be the windows. But that's, um, <laughs> but that's a problem I don't think we would have in the CX-30. But for me, I mean, I love that car. The other thing that other people say is that um, it seems to be more expensive than they thought. So they go look at yep. a Mazda 3 and they're quite shocked once they've spec'd it up. Oh, that's a lot of, you know, that's, that's quite a lot higher price than I thought it would be. So I have heard people saying that. Which is part of, part of uh, you know, the, the latest generation dropping some of the, or effectively starting at a, at a higher mm. um, entry point. Um, yeah. And I'm sure there would be a little bit of showroom shock when uh, people are having a look at it. But I mean, you look at it, it looks like an Alpha Romeo. You, look, you feel like you're getting a lot of car. It's, it's great to drive. I mean, yeah. I would have that over CX-30 every day. I was, I was a bit surprised by those figures. Yes. And uh, it, Byron, where do you stand? It's a bit of a polarizing look, especially in hatch form with the Mazda 3. I, for one, love it. I think it's an absolute masterclass. Others are completely the opposite. Um, where do you stand on the whole Mazda 3 thing? Well, first of all, uh, just to clarify with Stephen Corby, um, we are talking about the Mazda 3, not the Tesla 3, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, secondly, uh, <clears throat> I think that the Mazda 3 is indeed one of the most striking and, and pretty um, small cars on the market. And clearly Mazda went for a compact kind of diminutive shape that, yep. um, that you know, might attract people, maybe younger singles or, 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 or empty nesters or that sort of thing who just don't, just don't need the, um, the volume, the boot volume in the back seat. And while the CX-30, I think, was deliberately designed to become the... Uh, kind of the family car or the second family car as it may so yeah i, I think in a, in a way mazda foresaw the diminishing role of the small car with the mazda 3 and decided well we'll make this one a bit of a design statement maybe something that uh keen drivers can really connect with and we'll make the cx30 the kind of the duller family car yeah, the more and, practical pragmatic common sense mm, kind of mm. option yeah but that's an interesting thought but having said Just what you say, James, about the style, that a colleague of ours, uh, Tim Keane, says he doesn't like it because he finds it too macho. He says too it's macho? Too macho. And it's too, I, know, I look at it and think, I kind of think it's designed to appeal, very cleverly designed to appeal to, you know, uh, to a woman and a man in different ways. I yep. think it's yeah, very yeah, clever yeah. like that. But um, he said he finds it too macho and I think he even said too aggressive, which is not. Too so aggressive. That's thought. interesting. That's an insight into Tim's uh, personality and yeah. makeup. Possibly. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and you're spot on there, uh, Stephen. The car is absolutely reminiscent of the Alpha Sud or, or Alfa Romeos anyway. And I think that in years to come, people will look at that car and think, gee, what a, what a design classic. 
Looks yeah, so true. good. Well, we're talking about the five-door hatch. The sedan is a, is a lot more conservative, but certainly the five-door hatch is uh, uh, thick rear pillar and um, kind of low-slung look. Just, you know, it's a real head-turner. I love it. I, I think the Alpha Suit comparison, comparison no, I was just going to say, I think the Alpha Suit comparison comes up short when you think about the quality of the steel used to actually construct the car. There's probably a marked difference there. It's too good to be an alpha. But no, I, I, I always wonder about the sedan. Did they go, oh, this is beautiful. We've got the hatch. It's fantastic. Why do we make an ugly one just for fun? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, the alpha, sorry, the alpha um, connection actually uh, continues inside with the, the cockpit. Like it, it is very much a, um, an, an Italian-esque interior in terms of the way that the, the, uh, the instruments wrap around you. They remind me of... Uh, the Porsche 968 slash 944 and the way that the dials are just kind of laid out horizontally in front of you and that thin uh, thin spoke, uh, that three spoke steering wheel. It, it's really cool. And it, it translates into the way design uh, drives too. It's a real driver's car. I, I love, yeah. love but don't you it. But you wish they would make a sporty one. Like it would be so great because it looks so sporty if they made a properly sporty one. I've never understood why. Well, they say there's no demand and they know, I guess, but I'm surprised that there's not a Golf GTI competitor. Yeah. in that car well the americans yeah. get a turbo version they, yeah, well, this yeah. year they introduced the, the turbo version in that car. Yeah. and that that's right i mean and that created a lot of buzz in terms of are we going to get some kind of mp uh, version of of the three but that's all cooled i think a little bit in recent times and we may well get a turbo but it won't be a specifically performance focused version of the car mm. needs a rotary um, and suicide doors yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's interesting also now it's sitting at 13,344 registrations in Australia for this year. So that's 11 months worth of sales. And for that same period, the Corolla is at 23,366. The Hyundai i30 is outselling it. The Kia Cerato is outselling it. Now, each of those three other brands have a bunch of different SUVs uh, that they can also offer customers. And yet their hatch and more conventional car sales haven't fallen off quite as steep a cliff um, as the Mazda 3 has, um, which, which is kind of odd. Mm. That well, kind okay. of the hatch argument, doesn't it? Because yeah, if those people are still buying hatches, but I think Corolla buyers are just going to buy Corollas. I mean, they go out and buy cars with their eyes closed and just, you know, <laughs> yes, fair call. Yes. Like a robot. Well, it's a good thing it's yeah. a good car, but yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. I, exactly. I think to your point, Byron, I'd, I'd possibly take slight issue with that because the latest Corolla has been much more adventurous, um, yes. is much more fun to drive. That that platform, the TNGA platform that it sits on, has transformed it as um, in terms of involvement and and fun to drive. But um, I suppose there is just that whole Corolla thing that it is such a safe and and secure kind of choice that you're going to have people bowling up to it for that reason alone. I know an older lady was recently in a, she had an accident in a Corolla. She was going to replace the car and her son rang me and said, oh, what should you buy? And we went back and forth and he said, he rang me and said, she just wants another Corolla. Corolla. Said, yeah, that's right. She just wants another Corolla. Right. And yeah. I'm surprised at how good the new one is, hasn't put uh, traditional buyers off. And isn't yeah. it astonishing that the Corolla hatch currently suffer, has by far the smallest boot in its class, uh, you know, it's smaller. It's than tiny. The it's tiny. tiny. Yeah. And yeah, that still doesn't seem to have made a dent in, in no. the way, um, in, well, in, in, in its sales. Mm. Um, the, but it, it's interesting, Steve, you make that mention of it's almost like muscle memory, time to buy a car, time to buy a Corolla, you know, replacing it with another one. Mm. Um, we had some friends who had a Outback wagon and uh, they needed another car and bought an identical Outback wagon. Just. That, that's it. We need two cars. We need two cars. This one's good. Well, we'll buy another one. And it's unimaginable for us, isn't it, to have that lack of adventure? If I had the opportunity to have two cars, they'd definitely be different cars. I'd, I'd try There's something no different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter how much yeah. I loved it, I just want something yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Mazda's saying that, look, the, the, the CEO of the company locally, uh, Vinesh Bindi, has said that there's a good chance that some of those customers, meaning Mazda 3 customers, have ended up with other products in our range, um, which, is, which is fair enough. But there's also the point we touched on earlier. The entry point for the Mazda 3 has jumped $4,500. So you're getting extra equipment. There's, a, there's more safety in there. And Mazda is pretty impressive in terms of the level of standard safety they put across the Mazda 3 and a lot of their products. And there's a, a, a longer list of standard equipment which kind of smacks of a conscious decision um, to yeah, send it in a certain direction. It could be the retirees who want a, a snazzy car 
um, to, to get around town in um, and the others are looking for a more pragmatic choice. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's, it's funny when out. it came out, though, because it looks so great. I just thought this is going to be a massive seller. I, yeah. I really thought that thing would just dominate. For a while, it, it, it sold very strongly. It was just that initial uptake uh, of people that were in love with it um, yeah. and had to have one, and it seems to have softened off. Well, isn't that um, the coupe? Isn't that the coupe uh, trajectory where it, you know, fashionable looks uh, only yeah. last a certain amount yeah. of time before you know, yeah. it becomes unfashionable? So maybe you're right there too, James. Well, I think in, in responding when Tung was talking to Mazda, he also spoke to the head of marketing, Alistair Doak, and, and Alistair said, you know, would you rather have no bestsellers or they'd rather have no bestsellers, but a very strong sales across the portfolio? That's a healthier place to be. I think in a, in a subtle dig at the likes of Ford that has a very strong Mustang Ranger is trying to substantiate their range behind those two leaders whereas Mazda wants to have a very solid offering in, in multiple segments, which seems like a sensible business decision. Mm, very much so. There's no doubt how well Mazda does in this country. Like Mazda's, we're yeah. probably uh, number one or two market in the world for Mazda. They do a great job here of selling that brand. Yes. I don't know about you guys, but whenever, um, whenever you go to South Korea um, and North America and the subject of Mazda comes up, the first question is, what is it with Mazda in Australia? Why is Mazda mm. successful in Australia? What are they doing that they're not doing here? Um, and for mine, Australia was a test market really uh, for Japanese car exporters. And Mazda was successful in setting up a very strong retail network and building relationships with customers and the product backed all that up. But um, I just think they've done a very good job of looking after their customers in this country. And the big advantage is not pronouncing it Mazda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Matsuda. Yeah, I, I, I had that uh, conversation with a couple of American Mazda people uh, with, who were sitting with Canadians and the Canadians were uh, pr pronouncing Mazda, Mazda, while the Americans were saying Mazda. And oh, I said, there's your problem right there. Mazda just sounds, yeah. I don't know, unappealing. Well, well, it's also Nissan in, uh, in the US, isn't it? And mm -hmm. it's very much Nissan here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, it'd be, it'd be good to uh, get people listening or watching, get your thoughts on the whole Mazda 3 conundrum um where do you sit do you do you think it's um it's a, a rational business decision to broaden your range and get strong sales across a portfolio or is um should the mazda 3 still be a hero uh, for the brand which it has been uh, over time so it'd be it'd be good to get your thoughts and if but, people um, are embarrassed to own one now they'd like to sell me their second hand one cheap i'll have it that's very good yes that's a great, that's a great option that too um, we're going to move to our garage now and the cars residing within it. And Steve, if we could kick off with you, you've been in a really interesting vehicle that I know, Byron, you've had experience with recently and so have I. So it's a good one. Tell us all about it. So, yes, I had the Genesis GV80, which was an interesting experience, much like uh, much as I'm often mistaken for um, George Clooney. Um, <laughs> This car was mistaken for just about you, every. You have that problem I'm, too. That's amazing. all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah, and and we, I thought we decided it was George Hamilton. Look, it happened yeah. just a minute ago. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> or George Glass. Remember George Glass from the Brady Bunch? Mm. Uh, Joe yeah. Brady's fake boyfriend. As Donald Trump Jr. said, it must be the lighting. Um, <laughs> so no, so people came up to me and said, "Oh, what's that fantastic car you got outside your house? Is it um, is it a Bentley?" I got uh, several people thinking it was a Bentley. Other people thought it was an Aston Martin. I had Porsche. I had uh, Mercedes Benz. All of these people, and I had the Brunswick Green, which is this kind of almost uh, Bentley race, you know, British racing green. Fabulous. But yeah. I must mention that the, the car, the color I wanted most. It also comes in Matterhorn White and Gold Coast Silver, but my absolute favorite color, possibly of all time, Melbourne Grey. Melbourne Grey. Oh, someone was having a laugh there. That made me That's unconscionably really happy. I told you, Melbourne Grey. Oh, fun fact. Fun fact. I'll interrupt you. My Honda Prelude from 1989 is also called Melbourne Grey. Oh wow! So it's copyright. They should have put yeah. copyright. Well, I thought it was not, it, not even. Well, maybe it's Melbourne Blue. I think it's it's an actual colour. So um, I was, I've got to say, um, one of my favourite colours. Shout out to my mate uh, Matt. He had a Datsun 180B in Kalahari tan. Kalahari. Kalahari Tan. That is one of the best colours I've ever heard of. Uh, and also a, good, a great drag name, Kalahari Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, Steve, the anyway, yeah, so, so It was, it was uh, mistaken for all those things and uh, people really, really liked the look of it. Everyone very impressed by it. I was, having driven Genesis previously, I had that the problem that I've had with Lexus where you're in it, 
and I can just tell too much that the Lexus is Toyota. There's bits that I can touch, bits I can feel right. and feel and make me remind me that I'm in something related to a Toyota. And that was yeah. a problem with the early Genesis. It just felt like, oh, that bit's a bit, you know, that feels a bit cheap. I found almost everything about the GV80 felt class. I felt it rode really well yeah, as well. Right. I yeah. was um, very, very impressed. I thought it was, uh, it's a car they should have made the first time. I think yeah. it really is like a, a luxury competitor. And then we all played guess the price and, you know, the new price was right. And everyone was going, you know, people I'd ask would think it was over, over 130, maybe 140. And actually you can get one for under 100. But mine was obviously the 3.5 and it starts about 108. But uh, yes, I was, I was not not expecting me to be as impressed as I was. Although it does have this ridiculous feature where it has this um, sounds of nature, which you can play through the stereo. We can have a fireplace Yes, and, and snow and so on, and that I've found birds, birds, very Tesla. Yeah, but the worst one is the open air cafe. Like, yeah, that you just get the sound of clattering plates. <laughs> so someone yeah. making coffee, and, and people on the, the background. Yeah. It's like I don't and, want this to and, like, and you, <laughs> and you're abusing waiters for um yeah, for you the wrong <laughs> coffee. No good. I yeah. wish I was yeah. in Melbourne Grey. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, gee, clearly you and I have drove, drove different cars there but anyway James what yeah. do you think <laughs> no I think it looks amazing I think it looks stunning the, 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 it was a misstep there was that um, almost misattribution when Genesis was first kicked, was kicked off in Australia and then became a Hyundai Genesis it was all quite confused and really ran the risk of crueling its chances in the longer term but I think calling time, stopping and saying, all right, let's have another go at it and do it properly will potentially pay off. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I've got a long way to go to build that brand, but on the basis of that product and the way it looks and feels uh, and drives, they're off to a pretty strong start in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But Brian's about to tell us we're wrong. So here we yeah. Go. yeah. Yeah. I get that feeling. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I think that car is very much a car of two ranges. Uh, I agree with the brilliant, uh, in my six diesel, just terrific torque, great acceleration, you know, a, a refinement that is, in my mind, equal of uh, European luxury diesels, and also the, uh, the 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 petrol that V6 petrol also has the the level of refinement you expect in an X BMW X5 competitor, mm. but that four cylinder turbo, that two point five turbo, I think. Um, undermined the car. I, I, I found it, it rode a little bit too jittery uh, and it was, the suspension was either too soft and quiz inducing or too firm and uncomfortable. Mm, wow. Okay. So that that's was my, that was my opinion, but you know, we drove at different times in different places and that's the hmm. beauty of having, um, of having the ability to do that, I guess, isn't it? I think well, I also, surely that would surely the, um, the basic engine, it's like a uh, showroom, showroom bait surely you'd get in it drive the other one to buy the big one i mean and buy the bigger one buy with that engine yes yeah but yes. then it gets, I'm, I'm, it's I'm right up I'm, there though mm. i must admit the our most recent experience was in the 3.5 and um it's a it's a very nice uh, experience i must say very smooth mm. um yeah maybe it is a, a bait and switch yeah <laughs> Uh, well, the ride one's interesting. Ride is often that the thing that people, um, you know, that people disagree on. I thought the ride was was good. It's Same not here. like Mercedes Benz, but I was surprised how good it was and much better than I thought their last effort. And so yeah. far removed from, you know, a Hyundai, as you know, yeah, it's quite impressive. So, what but, model yeah. were you driving? Which one are you talking about? The same one as James. It's three point five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, one with all the fruit. Yeah, well, all the fruit, <clears throat> and that's uh, that. Where it is where it becomes. A, an expensive proposition. Yes, you get heaps of standard features, but gee, you're up with up against some pretty compelling rivals. So yeah, good point. I, well, that's that's the I, thing you have to say. Would you actually buy one next to a German yeah. car? In the end, that's going to be the decision. I think there'll be some early adopters to buy it because because of that. Wow, what have you bought? Thing. I've got something that's completely different to everyone else. And people don't even know what my car is. People might think I bought a Bentley, but yes. um, if you actually if you actually shop them against each other and you're an enthusiastic drive or a motoring enthusiast yeah. you're going to buy the german car but i think yeah. um i think there's a lot of people out there who would buy this car on image and it feels expensive i feel like i get a lot of lot for my money but yes as you say yeah. that's mine was mine was pushing over 120 with the options yeah, and the, right, and the and so right. On. yeah. yeah. also uh, you may recall that uh, do you re do you recall where the uh the uh tailgate release is in that car on the uh on the wiper blade yeah like Kind of grosses me out, but you have to touch a, you have to press a wiper. <laughs> you can use the key bar. 
Yeah, I know you can use a key, but often <laughs> you can't. Like, or, or you know, if you don't have the key, or you, you yeah. just go for it. I think that to me, if you don't have the key, seems, we seems gimmicky and kind of cheapens the car. But I don't know. Maybe prove oh, you wrong, guys. But I, I, and I think I think the thing to consider is, is um, in North America, my theory is that people are much more open to to a new brand. There's mm-hmm. loyalty, of course, but even in the premium space witness of the relative success of infinity although it's 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 still got a, a way to go but the uptake of genesis in the u.s has been pretty strong um and it it looks like it's succeeding there australia a little more conservative not not uh, not ready except for those early adopters um mm. it'll be interesting to see how it goes mm-hmm. james do you like the looks of the car i do i do um it's distinctive and i mean that in a good way rather than a than a bad way i think it does set the products apart and and sets a bit of a template for where the brand might go yeah i think it's strategic and certainly a smart way to get noticed in a crowded segment mm. um, but you're you not in like love it. with the way they look you don't like it then well i think a bit of beauty you know in any car is is a good thing <laughs> Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm, just, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna I'm sit here and just dream about beautiful cars. It's but, not yeah. that it's ugly; it's just lacking in any beauty. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. It's, well, a bit, it's a bit stark. You think it's a bit too abrupt? Yeah, I think it's a little bit in your face. Yeah, well, everyone yeah, it. When I, I first saw it at the end, I crossed the car park and I, I didn't know what it was, and I was like, "Oh, what?" All right, and then kind of worked it out but then i had it for a week and it grew on me i'm not saying i didn't like it at first and and you, you kind of get one over by how, how much other people like it and the people stand there go that's particularly beautiful and you go oh okay but if you don't look straight on at the grill it, it certainly has angles that are not right wonderful it's not it's not a purely resolved it's not an aston martin space it mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. i said that you, you, anyone who thinks it's an aston martin's had too much psilocybin on their breakfast here <laughs> yeah and i it, the interior on the top spec ones looks like donatella the versace just yeah, ralphed all over it. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say it was, you know, Donatella Versace's stretched hey, all man. over it. You know, the, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I, I, she's a bit leathery. She's it. a bit leathery. Yeah, I mean, we, oh no, we we love Donatella, and she's uh, she's she's an inspiration for us all. Um, it's she's clearly my the G V eight favorite is. Mutant Ninja Turtle. Yeah. <laughs> How did we get to Donatella Versace and Mutant Ninja Turtles? Anyway, How didn't we next, get to it next? How didn't we? Next up, thank you very much, Steve. Next up, Byron, you have been using a vehicle um, and exploring and exploiting um, its abilities in particular areas. Fill us in, please. Well, yes. So uh, I've been driving the uh, MY21 Ford Ranger Wildtrak, which is, as you know, uh, part of the second best selling line of cars in Australia. So it's a very relevant cars, a re- 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 very relevant range. And uh, People who know me might recall that I'm not a fan of pickup trucks. I just think that for many reasons, they are, are not suited for, uh, for a lot of parts of Australia, but that's, that's, another, that's, another, um, that's another story for another time. So I was pleasantly surprised when I got hold of the bi-turbo model. So this is a wild track yep. uh, with the uh, two-litre or is it two liter? Yeah, two liter. Four cylinder. Yep, two yep, four liter cylinder four. Uh, yep. twin turbo and the uh, ten speed automatic transmission. Yep. And uh, I, I've got to say that I think in my mind it surpasses uh, cars like the Volkswagen Amarok in terms of just refinement and civility mm. for a truck like mm. this. So, but yes. that's not what I got it for. I got this car because I needed to transport a couple of my older vehicles uh yep. quite long distances too so i had to go into rural victoria to um yep. from melbourne to to uh to get these cars repaired variously and the first one was uh my um citroen bx this this is essentially the logistics wing of honest byron motors that's right where you yep. you need to distribute your vehicles out to various suppliers that's yep. right and uh, and I, I do share my cars because you know, having 15 cars at the moment I can't believe I've got 15. And I live Unreal. in you know, 15. You know, I live in Brunswick. So, yeah, um, I, I do need to transport some cars around. So, uh, anyway, so I had some fears. I thought, well, I'm, I'm driving this car. I'm going to put it to the test. It's not the three, uh, it's not the 3.2 litre five cylinder um, uh, nail that, I mean, uh, 
engine that uh that you know, most rangers have you know that thrashy thing which is actually really talky and great for towing this one is is meant to be the uh, the up spec one and it just did the job brilliantly right, uh, right. maybe it was the gearing yeah. maybe it was just the uh the tuning of the uh of the, of the torque um, of, of, yeah. the, um, of the by turbo but it towed these cars and we're talking um a 900 kilogram car on the back of yep. um, towing a trailer. It just did it without, without fuss. Um, in fact, it was a situation where I was driving, it was a couple hundred kilometer drive. I was driving it and I forgot that I was, I was, um, wow. Was towing, uh, yep. And yeah, I had to pick this car from Brunswick. So I was in the inner city on a Saturday morning, um, just, you know, going, you know, in, uh, on, on, on narrow through narrow streets, almost a laneway. I had to do that thing where you're you have to back a trailer up, which um, oh. luckily I learned, and it just did it so well. Yeah, and I also love the fact that this Ranger has real four DNA steering, so it feels planted and um, and you know connected to the driver. Um, it, it was quiet. It didn't use as much fuel as I expected, and the seats are really good. So my point is that. Even though this mm. vehicle is is nine or ten years old, mm. uh, yeah, the, the bi turbo is only a couple of years old as an option. Mm. Um, I think it's still right up there at the top of the class, and good on you, Ford. Um, I also uh, towed my Mazda one two one bubble, and I think this is me coming out to you guys to let you know that I have a Mazda one two one bubble. Um, it's I, I'm sure um, the lovely Matthew Pritchard is um, has put up a photo of the car as as I speak. Um, that car only costs a couple hundred dollars and it needed saving. I think it's a future classic, but that also is probably Byron, just thinking about the trailer, does um, HBM, Honest Byron's Motors, have mm. its own uh, trailer or trailers, I presume? Or semi-trailer. Whole... Yeah, do you, do you have a covered one for the special cars? You don't uh, want to be seen in public? Uh, yeah, no, no. I, um, I, yeah, when, when I've got some, um, well, I have to do some covert car um, transporting. No, I, um, I have a sheet over the top, I presume. So I have a network of friends who have who have various things that I need: car covers, um, uh, repairs, uh, panel work, and of course a uh, a trailer. So a what was re- what was required on the one two one uh, bubble car? So, but neither of these cars are registered at the moment, ah. and uh, it just I, I had to pick one up. I could drop one car off and pick up the other. So. You know, it was just easier to use um, a mate's help and his trailer. So great, that's, that's what happened. So anyway, bottom line, uh, this Australian engineered designed yep. Uh, yep. car. You know, it's the it will be the last of the generation when this car goes out of production in its facelifted form in twenty twenty seven. Anyway, we should be proud that we've produced. Cool. Oh, it's a great experience. Yeah, it's I just like how proud of you I am for calling it a pickup truck because I'm sick of Australians calling these things utes. You want to call right. them a ute so that you don't feel so bad about the fact you've become coca colonized and bought American <laughs> American culture into your life. Yeah. That thing is a pickup truck all day. Yeah. And I'm glad you called it that. And I'm also very impressed that you could use the word civility when talking about a pickup truck. So well played. Well, and, and, and as I said, I, I, I'm not usually a fan of these cars. I'm a cyclist. I usually get harassed when I'm in the outer burbs. By, uh, by by people in in these pickup trucks who just kind of drive past me at ninety kilometers an hour, and I feel like I'm going to get sucked into their um into the vortex. vortex. Yeah, but yeah. Um, but yeah, th- this thing I, I totally get why uh, it's Australia's. It's often it often outsells the Hilux, and I, I totally yeah. get why. And the seventy grand or so, or I think it's closer to eighty that these cars command. You can kind of see uh, yeah. the value. In, well, you know, it, it, te- it tends to be strong in 4x4, four four, whereas Toyota gets a lot of sales in the 4x2 kind of workmate fleet type stuff as well. So it, it's a super strong seller. Mm. So it doesn't make you feel more aggressive when you drive it, Byron, because I know when Chester drives, he, like, he walks a little bit taller, he starts hanging around funny, <laughs> looking for bits of wood to buy. Like they actually change his personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I've got to say that there is that, that, Tonka, that Tonka truck um, desire that, is in all of us, I reckon, uh, comes yeah. out where you're playing with something that is just big and fun. Um, I think it's right sized for this country if you need a pickup truck, um, but only, you know, where it's actually needed, not, you know, yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, what percentage of people who buy the major need a pickup truck? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it's true. It's true. I mean, it, it, witness F series in in the US, um, yeah. and it's it's arguably the top selling car in the world. Um, mm. Can can that many people need a large pickup truck? Oh, no. no, and and they're just going to get larger, as you know, too. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, th- that's good. I better I better um, move us along. Thank you very much, uh, Byron. You're very I'll much. finish it off with uh, a Toyota Yaris Cross. So this is the new, slightly higher riding SUV style version of the Yaris. When I was in, there's a GXL two wheel drive, therefore front wheel drive hybrid, and its retail before putting it on the road is no less than ten dollars under thirty two thousand um, dollars. So this is a 1.5 litre three cylinder car um, with electric assistance, uh, a CVT, and as I said, front wheel drive. And the batteries and all the other governs that go together with the hybrid stuff means it weighs in at 1,650 kilos. It's, uh, it is no lightweight car. And to get all that around is a combined total of 85 kilowatts. Um, oh my goodness. So the, the Newton meters, 120 from the petrol engine, Toyota is always a bit cagey about what the uh, combined output on torque might be. I bet they're cagey um, about zero well, to 100 too. I bet. Um, <clears throat> so on the, on the plus side, I had that, you know, it's claimed 3.8 litres per 100 uh, kilometres, which is, which is pretty great. It has a really good boot. The inside is quite cool. You know, the, the design of the car, it's in line with Toyota's slightly more edgy take on, on design. Um, and inside the things like the, the dash and the instruments stand out. It's pretty well equipped in terms of safety and, and it'd want to be at, at those dollars. But, you know, things like LED headlights and other pretty premium features are in there. Um, on the negative side of the ledger, I just think despite it having this mechanical first gear thing on the CVT, it is, it is unrefined. It's not Toyota's finest hour in terms of a CVT. And I think there's just very little fluency in the powertrain. You know, you, you're not getting that nice, connected, effortless feel when you drive a car. It's as if different parts of the car are almost conflicting with one another to get you moving. Um, I didn't enjoy that. Um, there's also, for that money, $32,000 for a little SUV, I noticed that there's no clear coat around the edge of the tailgate inside or the engine bay. There are sort of penny pinching things, no grab handles in the rear of the car, although you can see the, the little recess where they're meant to go, that kind of stuff. Um, the engine bay also, when you look at it, it's, it's sadly Toyota does this occasionally. It's just a mess. It looks like a dog's breakfast when you open up the, the thing. And um, there's just a USB plonked in the dash, in the center stack, in the console. No thoughts of how to, to maybe finesse that a little and make it less prominent. It's just there. Um, I, I did not find it a particularly impressive car, particularly at thirty-two grand. Uh, kudos so, for using penny pinching, by the way. I, I, I know a girl named Penny Pinching. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm disappointed to hear that because um, the current crop of Toyotas, as you mentioned earlier, um, have come good in a lot. You know, yep. such as the Corolla yep. and even the Camry, and definitely the Rav. Yep. Um, and the CHR too, but yeah, I, I, I agree. This car just feels a little bit half baked in some ways. And yeah. to me, when you open the bonnet and you see the uh, the unpainted or the undercoat yeah. under, under the bonnet, it just it, you think, it looks to me like it, yeah, yeah, a tinted undercoat. It hasn't yeah. even had top coat, let alone clear yeah. coat. And that, that that extends not just to the cross; it's the Yaris and the, even the GR. And I think the GR actually it's painted, but with, with on the road, these cars are like thirty-five to forty. If you, you know, if you, you go a bit, a bit sick on the options. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah. saw a, I saw a beige one the other day, uh, a Yaris Cross, a beige one, and it was it looked tippy toed and it was driven, and uh, there was uh, there was some um, you know classic hits FM thing playing, and <laughs> the first thing that occurred to me was I thought. A Toyota should bring out a um, a Yaris Christopher Cross edition. Oh, <laughs> uh, for yeah, the... I don't get that car. I think they've tried, they've taken a ladybug and made a cockroach out of it. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, it, it, it to me when the Yaris arrived and the pricing was starting at such high level, it didn't make any sense. But then when the Yaris Cross comes in, you sort of think, all right, that starts to mesh together a little bit in terms mm. of a, a broader offering. But 
in terms of just the product and the, and the way it is to to drive and whatever, I found it um, under underwhelming. I think. Yeah, it's so expensive. And, you know, and, and so it's, expensive. Yeah. And it's not it's not much behind a CHR, which to me seems a lot more sophisticated. Yeah. And uh, certainly better finished or presented, not finished. I'm sure that it's it's what it's finished as well as any Toyota. Uh, and yeah, better looking too, in my mind. We're back to beautiful cars, there, boys. <laughs> That's good. We'll we'll now leave the garage and move on to feedback from last week's uh, show, and we were talking there about the um, arrival of the next generation of the Toyota Land Cruiser, so the 300 series. We had more intel in terms of when it's going to arrive in Japan, when the likely landing point here is in Australia, the engines, the on it goes. So. Uh, particularly our very own Chester has been pulling a lot of that detail together. And we had feedback. I I'd, I'd put it in, in three little batches. Mm -hmm. And one is like, they love what they have. And uh, Rockbiter HD says, I feel like Greg Norman walking on a beach every time I drive my 100 series turbo diesel. Why would you want anything else? And um, I went to Instagram to get a pic of the shark and that oh. uh, quite controversial, provocative photograph of him walking on the beach. And Oscar Mac 31 on Instagram <laughs> said, shark, dog, and python. Uh, which, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. But uh, Limpen Singh 22 said, maybe we'll wait and see, but I'm still very happy with my 200 right now. And Ian Dibley came in and said, that goes for me too. Remember the 2007 Land Cruiser problems. I'm not doing R&D Toyota. I'm keeping my 200. So there are people that uh, are keeping their powder dry until they see how the new car works out. Uh, they don't want to be the, uh, the test guinea pigs. Um, then I've put into another batch, which is called Get Over It. Uh, I've called it that. Um, Marcus Holter says the same feelings were felt around the Land Cruiser when Toyota dropped the 4.2 litre inline six and the live front axle. That seems to have worked out pretty well for Toyota. Keep And it says, keep the great content coming. So thank you, Marcus. Um, but that, that more than a few commenters were in the same bay. And Birdie, proud Victorian Birdie says, you know, the 300 series is an all new design. I'm sure the 200 series will seem agricultural, bracket, apologies to primary producers in bracket, um, <laughs> in comparison. And of course, it will have a Apple CarPlay. That in itself uh, is reason to save your moolah and weight. So he's, he's seeing positive things in the potential uh, 300 series. And then on the hybrid, there was specific comment on the hybrid. Oggy Oggy says, uh, can't wait to see these battery packs and electric motors wading through the ocean and doing river crossings. And that is kind of interesting. I could see sparks kind of emanating around the edge of the door frames when you're fording a little, a little creek. I don't know about you guys, but it, you know, electricity and water always seem somewhat uh, problematic. Mm. Um, but Taresk Isloki says he sees only two potential issues with the hybrid uh, Land Cruiser. Corrugations, so the battery cells and severe vibration that wouldn't be normal in other hybrids. That'll be an interesting area to look at. And the gross vehicle mass, you know, the Land Cruiser 200, uh, notoriously small window for load once you throw a few accessories on and put some people in it. How's a big bank of batteries going to affect that? And I think they're both valid points. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, just trust the Toyota is going to get that thing right. It means too much to them and they're pretty good at it. Well, it's not just Australia as an arduous market. You think about the Middle East, you think about um, mm -hmm. other markets where Toyota sells its four-wheel drive uh, utes and SUVs and what have you. They're, they're, it's not like it's their first go around with it, but still... No. It, it will be interesting. But the hybrid is an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I reckon that uh, Toyota may take a leaf out of Nissan's book and uh, keep both generations going, um, particularly if, if um, you know, they want to uh, appeal to two different types of uh, buyers, one who, one who wants the, uh, the luxury and the technology that a 300 will offer, while yeah. the others who want an absolute agricultural workhorse type scenario. And... I mean that that might be the answer. Like that will probably mm. should please everyone. If you you know, if you want to keep the the traditional virtues of a Land Cruiser and not you know stray into new territory, just stick with stick with the old one. Um, Toyota offers the seventy eight series and the Troopy and all that sort of stuff. So you know, there's form there, and why wouldn't it yeah. with the latest one? 
I suppose it's all, it's a classic case, isn't it? Where it just seems so logical when you're an outsider, but then, mm, okay, we've got to keep building the LC200. Uh, we've got to build the 300. Where are we going to do that? What about the two? I think logistically it happens from time to time. You're absolutely right. But um, it just might be tricky in the lean way in which Toyota runs its business. But pricing, I mean, these cars aren't going to be cheap. I mean, look at no. Toyota seems to be on the March art market. And this is probably a discussion for another time. Um, following in Mazda's footsteps as well, I mean, things are yep. suddenly getting expensive. And it's sure. had two or three, every, every core model pretty much has had a, a, a significant price rise this year. Um, and I, I think it would be naive to think that Toyota, the 200, oh. the 200 replacement is going to be priced like Definitely. the 200. So we'll have new engine V6, you know, they, they have to amortize the cost of that. Whereas the one that's outgoing, it's been around forever. It's probably not costing them very much to, to bolt together. So yeah, there'll be a, there'll be a price rise. I think blind Freddie could see that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, and also Richard, our own Richard Berry put a shout out to people when we were talking about utes. He said, which SUV would you like to utify? Which SUV would you like to see as a ute? And so we had a couple of responses. Uh, Yamal Kumarasari said you could utify an M3. Now, not exactly an SUV, but uh, he says the template's already there. And of course, you guys will remember uh, the M3 made into a ute that was uh, banging around the Nürburgring there. I think it started off as an April Fool's joke and then BMW actually made it. And I thought it was brilliant um, at the time and pretty much proof that you can utify anything. Remember, um, we did the Top Gear Stuart Apple. We had one made. You had one made. The Golfer had one oh, made. Wow. From, remember, years, years and years ago, we had it made. Yeah, it was right. fantastic. <laughs> Unreal. The, now, Grudlin74 said he would utify a Tucson. Now, I was thinking that's kind of like the Santa Cruz that's, uh, that's coming up, but uh, mm. interesting. Maybe a hot Ford Puma, but there's that focus-based ute, which we think will be called the Maverick, um, which is, I think, a prospect for next year. But then he says, speaking of blurring the lines... Um, bring back the Cortina as a ute uh, with a great characterful engine for nostalgic Malou and Storm petrol heads. And I found a couple of images, I was aware, oh, as you guys are, I'm sure, of the Cortina ute in South Africa. It was the, um, I found the 3000 Leisure Backy, uh, oh. which was the Cortina ute in various generations of the Cortina. Wasn't it called the T100 as well? Or oh, like absolutely. That? This yeah. was a special edition. The oh, 3000 right. Leisure Backy. Right. Um, is a, a special edition. The Bucky or think, Bucky? Because they call you Bucky's. Bucky, but B A Bucky, B A double K I E, Bucky. Oh, I think that's just for South African pronunciation. They pronunciation, have Bucky. absolutely. Bucky. <laughs> now, um, Marco Vess, who last week told us he's actually Marco V E S S, but I prefer to call him Marco Vess, is on the Bentley Bentayga. Um, who wouldn't want to roll around in a sweet jewel cab Bentley Bentrady? And he's <laughs> he's. He's, someone's in ahead of him, Deviant Art and various others have already come up with renders um, of a Bentayga ute. So for those watching us on YouTube, there it is on the screen. But talking of the weird and wonderful, it is time for Muskwatch. Right, so the first news uh, this week is that the deer leader has decided to move from California to Texas. And he was in conversation with Matt Murray, who is the editor in chief of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and that's up there on YouTube. And we had a, a look and a listen to that. And Elon's view is that Silicon Valley is now full of what he calls redwoods. That is old school companies. So Silicon Valley has become old and fuddy duddy and too uh, covered in dust and cobwebs for him and that there are a lot of what he would call borderline monopolies. And he didn't name names, but he used the example that in America, um, confectionery businesses, companies, candy companies, there are only three of them that control the whole thing. I think he's had that be in his bonnet for some time. He wanted to challenge Warren Buffett, um, one of his confectionery companies, <clears throat> and make a line of his own uh, sweets. But he reckons there's the MBA MBAization of America, that, that, that it's gone very conservative. Um, he wants people to spend less time on financials, less time in a conference room on PowerPoint, more on product development, more time on the factory floor, more time with customers. Is your product as awesome as it could be? It's kind of the don't watch the scoreboard analogy. Forget about the financials. If you're building a brilliant product that your customers love, all that looks after itself. And I have got to agree with him 100%. And he says, if a team has been winning too long, they do get complacent. 
a little entitled and they don't win the championship anymore. So he's looking to, to mix things up. And for once, I agree with him wholeheartedly. He's moving because Starship um, production for SpaceX is in Boca Chica, Texas. He's building the Giga Texas, which is under the construction. And Giga Berlin's firing up. So he reckons he's going to be between Texas and Berlin for a lot of his time. And the video, the funny thing is that um, after all that, and it all seems uh, really compelling, Leo Medina commenting on YouTube said, moving to Texas, that's Elon, moving to Texas. Everyone, Elon Musk wears bandanas because he actually has a bandana <laughs> around his neck while this video was being recorded. So I thought that was probably the key takeout of the whole thing. And then... Um, the Boring Company, the Boring Company, we haven't heard much about the Boring Company recently, but we did know that they won a contract to make a tunnel uh, out from and back to the Las Vegas Convention Center. So the Boring Company posted um, a little gif that uh, Elon retweeted saying tunnel rave, and it's a Vici music with some colored lights in what must be a station in this um, tunnel loop that's now under uh, construction. And Samantha said, uh, will there be mushrooms? Which is a fair <laughs> question. And Dark Winter said, has anyone thought about sending train cars through the tunnels? I imagine it would be far more efficient. I can't wait for Elon to invent the underground rail system. That'll be dope. <laughs> and <laughs> Xantha Perterex says, well, stop showing off and show it for real instead. Or, well, that, of course, would let people down since they would see how limited and useless this project is. And Bread Dog said, what a boring rave, because it's just a Tesla rave. platform, boring rave, and some <laughs> uh, coloured lights going off. But uh, there you go. And the share price is at, for Tesla is at $607. It has crested $600 yet again. It was $568 last week. It hit a high of $653 on Wednesday. And The Street, a website called The Street, I was looking at them and they say, Tesla is trading at $650, gets a $90 price target from JP Morgan. So increasingly uh, well-respected share advisor companies are saying this can't go on. Hmm. JP Morgan's told clients not to increase their holdings in Tesla uh, to approximate its weight as the Standard Poor's 500 ahead of its inclusion to the benchmark on December 21. So because of its um, uh, market capitalization and four profitable quarters, Tesla is now in the S&P 500. And uh, that caused a lot of people to jump in and, and send the stock even further up. It's added 660% to the group share price uh, in a year, uh, more than half a trillion dollars to the company's market value. And net income for the third quarter of this year was just $337 million. These things don't seem uh, to add up. So. Time will tell, but uh, they, they look as though they might sell uh, produce 500,000 cars for the year with big numbers coming out of China, but still the production and the sales and the profit does not add up to the uh, market capitalization they have, which is $609 billion, which is more than Volkswagen, Audi, Daimler, GM, BMW, Ferrari, Honda, Ford, Fiat, Chrysler, Peugeot, and Porsche combined. That's insane. That's just crazy. It just defies so, gravity, doesn't it? <laughs> all of those companies together are five hundred and eighty-nine billion, and Tesla is six hundred and nine billion. I imagine if you put all their sales together and put them next to Tesla sales. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You're buying so, an idea. <laughs> anyway, there it is. And with that, we have reached the finish line. And I want to say thank you, Steve. Pleasure. And, th and thank you, Byron. And thanks to our stand-in hair boiler, bike mender and protector of the realm, Mr. Pritchard, for his production handiwork. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, hold on, let me overthink this. A camo kilt and Trump 2020 sneakers. Get them while they're tepid. Um, let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple Podcasts listener, please rate and review us. Remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest reviews. But before we go, earlier this week, I saw a sports car being driven by a small sheep in a swimming costume. It was a lamb bikini. 
Oh. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, awesome. So good. Thanks, Dad. <laughs>